Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 657. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's April 13th, 2021. All right, welcome to another episode. We're glad you're here to watch us all the way through to the end before we get too far. It's best that I advise you now to like the program on Facebook or YouTube. If you have not subscribed yet, please subscribe. If you want to comment, please comment. Lots of comments last time on George's now infamous joke. And uh, subscribe, comment, 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 comment. Oh. And if you're sick and tired of looking at our faces, we have a podcast. You will find the link in the show notes so you can watch us, watch us, to listen to us on your iPhone or Android device. George, how you doing? Obviously, I'm discombobulated and just uh, not talking straight sentences. I hope you can do better. Well, we've had excitement this week. We had a lightning strike at church during the 1030 service, and it... Um, there was an arcing of light between a flash of electricity between the uh, uh, we have two down projectors on either side of the sanctuary that project downward the uh, screens for the service words and and you could see light lightning shoot across from one to the other and after the and all the power went out and I finished we finished the service uh, with the prayer books and I went over to the par to the office building and all the Power, all the fuses were tripped and the power surge protectors were tripped and set everything back up again and found that um, all the office computers, the office photocopier, the sign that we have, electronic sign outdoors, uh, all were damaged or un inoperative from the lightning. Um, so church insurance company of Vermont, here we come That's with right. a major claim. <laughs> Big claim. Now your church is pretty high up you're uh, on the biggest hill in the county there right we no, kevin we are the highest church in florida ah. we're the highest episcopal church in florida i don't mean liturgically i no, mean no. in elevation <laughs> yes of course liturgically <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah i mean lightning strikes in churches happen often uh, you get the steeples you get the spheres and stuff like that i i don't hear it so much in uh, 1960s 70s contemporary architecture but uh you know one strike takes out a lot of electronics and i certainly hope we can get you back online there in fact church lightning strikes are so common that it happened to myself back in the 1980s when i thought i was on the the priest track or the pastor track I, I was in a non-liturgical church at the time. The uh, uh, pastor said, Kevin, would you like to give the uh, first service uh, Easter message for us? Sure, said 18-year-old uh, Kevin, I would love to. And I wrote to together, put a sermon together, and he helped me, and we're doing it great. And uh, service started, I got up on the lectern, and about a good two minutes in as I'm comparing two what I thought were great points lightning hit the church a fire started the fire department was called that friends was my last sermon <laughs> it was a sign that that probably wasn't my track <sighs> no quit no kidding all right so George let's move on to the the news here uh, not a lot people are tired clergy like yourself from Easter they're not getting into a lot of trouble so we don't have a lot to report on but I think the biggest story in Anglican.inc this week was nobody can agree, or at least the Orthodox and the rest of the world can't agree, when should Easter be? And I'm, I'm biased in this. I think from my reading of Scripture, it should be really close to Passover. You know, and I'm seeing that the Russian Orthodox don't want that, George. And I'm like, you know, if we can't agree on Easter... We're not a good witness to the world that we know what we're talking about. Well, we could always just sort of pawn this off. Well, it's the Russians, of course. You say black, they say white. Um, well, part of it is exactly that. The uh, There's been a move within uh, the ecumenical movement to have an agreed day for Easter. The Orthodox have already gotten on board and are going to accept the Western date rather than the Julian date. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, we used a calendar uh, that was 
basically adopted by Julius Caesar. And under Pope Gregory in the Middle Ages, we moved to a different calendar that was more accurate. So we use the Gregorian calendar today in the West, uh, all, basically all around the world. The Copts have agreed to come over, and the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew has uh, expressed interest of moving Easter to the uh, Western date. Well, that's enough for the Russians to say we're not even going to talk about it because the Russians are at war both literally and figuratively with the Ukrainians and the ecumenical patriarch about the independence of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. The Russians think it should be part of the Russian church. The Ukrainians want it to be their own church. And I'm not going to get into the rights or wrongs of that because that's something that... Uh, is insol insolvable by Kevin and I. But in an interview, Metropolitan Hilarion uh, said that, uh, no, this is not acceptable to the Russian Orthodox Church. No, we're not talking about it. Uh, this is from God, and we're not going to change uh, things according to the whims of man. I always have to wonder, you know, uh, Putin, he's been in power now for at least a century. How much influence he has in all this? Does he call and say, no, we're not changing the calendar? If Putin said, yes, let's change the calendar, would the Russian church change the calendar? Should we be working yes. this through Putin and not through uh, the church? Well, one of the things, the American media is so poor in general. They don't do a good job of reporting. They're more excited to talk about, more time is spent talking about baseball uh, whether or not it should be boycotted, than the fact that last week the Russian military went on full mobilization mm -hmm. and the uh, Russian ICBM uh, fleet uh, of uh, has been put into field positions ready for firing. Why? Well, You're this right. is, well, let me explain what full mobilization is. Mm -hmm. The army and all fronts, the northern fleet, have left their bases, they're at sea, the army have left their barracks, they're in the field. And this is as close as you, this is the neck, this is code red, a DEFCON 4. The Russian military is at DEFCON 4, to use American military uh, language. And it's over the Ukraine because the fighting in the Donbass region has uh, sort of intensified. And the Russians see, uh, this is my editorial opinion, the Russians see uh, Joe Biden is weak and now's the time to settle scores with the Ukrainians. Either retake the Ukraine for the Russian Empire or install uh, somebody more favorable to Russia. And the army is uh, on the march. And do we hear anything about this in the New York Times? Well, no, you'll hear an occasional uh, Associated Press piece or something, or but instead we have the wokeness of the Chauvin trial and other things that have of no real consequence to human history uh, this no, is you're, friends. You're this could right. be yeah. August. This could be August 1914. Yeah, all well, over. They didn't. They, they took uh, Crimea. Uh, Cri uh, Crimea. Crimea. Oh, sorry. They, a few years ago. Yeah. A few years ago, they took Crimea. Mm -hmm. Now that was less of a uh, under Khrushchev. Uh, Crimea was given taken from Russia to the Ukraine uh, for political purposes after uh, Stalin emptied the Crimea of mm -hmm. the. Uh, Crimean Tartars, so, and, well, we're getting into Stalinist history here, but, yeah, uh, this is a, the Russian Orthodox Church under Kirill, or Cyril, its current patriarch, follows closely the, the, the uh, political orthodoxy of uh, Vladimir Putin. The Russian Orthodox Church has a theology of nuclear weapons where it is lawful and moral to have first strike nuclear attacks on mm -hmm. the enemies of Russia. That's been published and stated. Uh, that, you know, there's been a, you know, Carol has visited Venezuela several times. Uh, he's visited Cuba, hardly hotspots of orthodoxy, but they're there that's places that Russia can sort of create mischief in this hemisphere. Um, now, there are many great, wonderful aspects to the Russian Orthodox Church, but at the same time, there are some problems, usually at the very top. There are problems, uh, you know, and it's it's been that way for, you know, generations, eons, and, you know, it's not an official state church, but they, they certainly, you know, 
uh, take the state line on so many aspects, and their idea of just war is much different than uh, St. August's you know, idea of just war. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind that the prior uh, patriarch was uh, outed as a KGB informer, codenamed Sparrow. Yeah. Um, so you, the Orthodox Church that you have down your street is not the Orthodox Church they have in Russia, nor is the Orthodox Church out in the countryside uh, dealing with the regular people. I'm talking about the powers to be uh, at the Moscow Patriarchate are intricately tied because remember, these guys are all our age and much older. Mm -hmm. And they had their initial training in the Soviet era, and they were only really allowed to go get ahead if they towed the line, if they were complacent. Now, there's a new generation arising within Russian Orthodoxy that is not tied to the state as tightly, but they are not in a position of authority yet. There was a scandal a few years ago where the uh, patriarch was uh, photographed and he had a wristwatch that was identified as costing some twenty thousand dollars it was some swiss gold thing or whatever yeah. and there was so a big shot. stink because he was talking about poverty and how the church is at one with poor people and he's got a twenty thousand dollar watch and so then the pre russian news agencies airbrushed the watch out but the problem was the reflection of the watch was still in the polished table that uh the, he was holding his hand over to sign a document. So, you know, that's that's the mindset at the top of the Russian Orthodox Church. Not universal, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there's some problems. There's problems in church everywhere. Uh, we've talked many times about England, and uh, this is a great time for a transition. England... The Church of England, for all intents and purposes, I consider lost. Okay, it's probably not going to be reformed, and there has to be other alternatives. One of the alternatives that's been put forward is, Kevin, you know there's the Free Church of England here. We would certainly uh, take on those who wanted to leave the Church of England into our folds and uh, grow that way. And the Free Church of England has made news this week because there's been a little controversy between the bishop and his desire and i don't know if there's a standing community that helped this at all or not but the bishop closed down a church and that made news uh around the world and we reported on it george well it made news around the world because we reported on it uh <laughs> that's one of the things that the free church of england is complaining about there's a church i think it's called saint michael's free church of england in middlesbrough which is in the northeast of england and middlesbrough is sort of like Youngstown, Ohio, or Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, you just don't see Middlesbrough when you're on your once-in-a-lifetime tour of England. No, it's no. In grimy, fact, if you arrive there, you, you, you were looking at the map upside down. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's not on. It's a it's the grimy northeast. It's mm -hmm. the uh, the Rust Belt of England. Well, uh, the uh, pastor there, a man named Jonas Brigatas. Uh, Jonas is a Brazilian that Kevin and I met at the uh, uh, Gafcon. Jerusalem conference yeah. at Gafcon. Young, excited, uh, evangelically moved from Brazil to the tea side of England. Something I wouldn't want to do, yeah. but nonetheless, he saw this as a missionary That's endeavor, true. and he had his church there. And the Church of England Council has closed it and advised him that he's going to be losing his job. And we see this in the Catholic Church all the time where the uh you know the arch uh chance the di uh, archdiocesan chancellery makes a decision to amalgamate churches close this close that and use the money realized from the sale of assets to do to fund other ministries and we get people protesting uh like parishioners protest we had this same thing too and the parishioners contacted us and went on to social media facebook and we released the statement and this was followed by a second, uh, where they accused the National Church Offices and Bishop Fennick of being, it's spelled Fenwick, but it's pronounced Fennick. Kevin's interviewed him, and I think you're, I'm right in saying that, Kevin? Yeah, you Fennick. are. Yeah, in fact, I'll put a, a link to the interview in the show notes. And the angeling, uh, tinkling of angels is interrupted by flow of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Well, we asked for a response. 
then the Brazilian wing of the Free Church of England announced they were going into broken communi communion with the uh, Free Church of England and John Fennick. They have a bishop, Joseph Rossello, I think his name is, mm -hmm. who's down there, and they're building churches left and right. And John Fennick responded to me this weekend, uh, and I, I'm sorry, he's responded their time Monday, my time late Sunday, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I posted their statement. And on one level, it's the same old story of a diocese trying to rationalize and consolidate its assets for more effective use. But at the same time, the pushback is that this was done non-pastorally and it was done arbitrarily and so on and so forth. And there's also a petition circulating among some Free Church of England clergy asking the Bishop John Fennick to step down. Now, part of this is, the occasion for bringing this all up is the St. Steve, St. Michael's Flap, which for those involved is a major crisis, but it's something, it's a crisis we've seen repeated in many denominations across the, the United States. Uh, Bishop Spong of Newark was famous for shutting down churches and seizing their trust funds mm -hmm. uh, to spend on uh, his latest fad. The uh, Free Church of England under Bishop Fennick has taken a trajectory like the Reformed Episcopal Church. It's moving away, its critics say, from its Reformed uh, Protestant traditions to a more Anglo-Catholic ethos. That's certainly true for the uh, Reformed Episcopal Church, but it's also starting to be true for the for the Free Church of England, and that is causing a great deal of internal friction. And whether or not it's true, I'm not in a position to say, but the, that is an accusation which has been denied. So there are theological fights within the Free Church of England that are piggybacking onto this uh, pastoral dispute between a bishop and a, and a parish. And you can read in detail the accusations on Anglican England from either side. It's not particularly edifying, but it does show that uh, Satan is alive and at work and see, uh, sowing dissension within the church. Absolutely. It's not just about Easter. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's about keeping your diocese afloat. You know, it's one of those things we've seen, you and I have seen this many times in the last uh, 20 and 30 years, and uh, Ian Douglas from uh, Connecticut, the Bishop of Connecticut is is retiring. And Connecticut is a great example of a once thriving Episcopal diocese, uh, you know, almost 200 churches at one time. And it's now just a, a skeleton of what it was because wrong decisions were made theologically and they weren't able to keep the churches full. And now there's just not much left of the diocese. And it, yeah, it, it's, it's hard I, I to... did my field placement at a church called Trinity de St. Michael's mm -hmm. and then uh, in uh, Bridgeport, uh, Bridge, uh, Fairfield. Fairfield, yeah. It's right on the suburbs of Bridgeport. And then I was uh, Laurie Thompson's seminary assistant. Laurie's now the dean of Trinity Seminary. Uh, further down the road in, uh, is it Trumbull? I think Trumbull. Uh, I was there for those three churches, in those two churches for three years. And at those time, each of those, Laurie's church is very healthy, very strong, full on Sundays. Trinity St. Michael's much smaller church was still full on Sundays. And the, I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, the, uh, the culture of New England has changed. It's become harder, stonier soil. Uh, but at the same time, there's some independent churches that are just doing great. And they would suck out people from... Uh, the Episcopal churches, who were all sort of ex alive and excited and wanted kids and the evangelical sure. excitement, yeah. they would go to these big in independent churches. And the Episcopal church responded by offering, not Laurie Thompson, uh, but the majority of the Episcopal churches would respond by offering watered down New York Times editorials. Uh, I had a friend who was uh, a curate at, uh, I think it was. Christ Church in Greenwich, the big giant church where George Bush was reared yeah, that's, as a child. That's, yeah. At that time, there were like 2,000 people. I think they're like 450 now. Mm -hmm. And I think half of them are paid choir members. Uh, that's unkind. Um, the, Darien, Connecticut. Uh, St. Paul's Darien is about, you know, is always on the verge of closing now. You know, it, so much has changed in, in Connecticut. 
So Ian Douglas, I personally like as a person. I think his theology and his politics are just dreadful. He, he's Very a dreadful. happy, proud socialist. Uh, let alone, let's get into a uh, discussion of uh, theology. Uh, he's a liberation theologian. He's, he's into a all, all these pure stuff. human secularist. You yeah. know, he would be an orthodox human secularist. But he's a lovely, decent guy. Nice guy. He's a nice guy. Nice guy. But yeah. the problem is that hasn't prevented a uh, wholesale now maybe half the people in his churches have moved to florida and i'll go to my church and i don't know <laughs> maybe, but, i don't know i'm in florida but the, but the fire that. of yeah. uh fire that kept the the uh, episcopal flame burning in connecticut uh is banking down very low right now mm. and that's a shame all right this week we got an email from a viewer asking about enneagrams uh, clearly he sees there's a danger and says, Kevin, George, is this something you see in the ACNA or the Episcopal Church? And what are your thoughts on it? And I wrote back right away, it's a fad. Uh, it's not a real good self-assessment tool. And I've not seen it used widely in any way, shape, or form in the ACNA. And even when I was in the Episcopal Church, I don't remember it being used as a, a way of self-assessment. However, other people have other experiences, I, I am sure. And we're we'll here from George and his, his experience. Is this the best way to find out about yourself? And I say, no, all these Briggs Myers and all these uh, Enneagrams don't really work well. And I know that because I had a wonderful teacher in high school. And I don't remember if it was the sociology class or something like that where he said, guys, tomorrow, uh, you may not know this about me, but I write horoscopes. And I want everybody to give me your birthday, give me your name, and I'll write a horoscope for you. And he showed up the next day, true to form, yellow piece of paper, and he gave me my horoscope. And I read it, and by golly, it was me. And it, I, I was revealed in this thing. It told me how my future was going to be, at least for the next week. And it made a lot of sense. And then a couple months later, he says, okay, I want you to take your horoscope and hand it to the person behind you. I said, oh, I don't know. I don't want them to know about me, but whatever. Handed it to the student behind me, and uh, the student in front of me gave me their horoscope, and it was the same thing. It says, the horoscopes aren't real. They're just using your mind to read into you, and you read into the, the, the subject that's on the page, and you adopt that as yourself. And that's how enneagrams work, and that's how uh, all these self-assessments is you're trying to figure out yourself by using human tools. And I don't think that works, George. It's uh, enneagram is now a fad within some uh, some Episcopal churches. I've seen it. There are some ACNA churches. There are a lot of I don't want to say a lot, but there are some evangelical churches that have taken up this fad. It's sort of stepping into the place that the Myers-Briggs personality test once had. When I went through the uh, commissional ministry, ministry process 30 odd years ago, 30, 35 years ago, I had to take a Myers-Briggs personality test and I came back uh, ENTJ or something. And it was thrown back to me that <laughs> we have no other ENTJs in the uh, ordination process. There must be something wrong with you. Well, and they were right. You know. They were right, but... <laughs> But uh, he, the Myers-Briggs personality test is, sort of, is based on Jungian archetypes. Mm -hmm. And Jungian archetypes are, are subjective and they're not scientifically testable. So they're, they have the same validity, I believe, as these magazine things that my wife would read in Cosmopolitan when we were younger. 12 steps to see if you have a healthy marriage, you know. Does your husband snore in bed? Does he spend large sums of money on women on Saturday nights and not beside yourself? You know, things like mm -hmm. that. Sure. Uh, the anagram, you may have seen its symbol, and it has an institute out there that promotes it. It's a circle with nine numbers on the circumference. And there's a triangle within the circle that connects three of the numbers and then there's a hexagonal shape, a regular shape that connects the other six. And it has a passing uh, uh, look of the pentacle that you see it, in it, satanic it, service. It looks like a but cultic 
it's so. a little but so it looks a little odd and a look and a little red flags but that's by association mm -hmm. and these i'll read you the nine personality types and in essence what you do is you find yourself somewhere within this pentacle of your reformer a I helper I an achiever an individualist an investigator a loyalist the enthusiast the challenger and the peacemaker and you can have primary and secondary characteristics and through their system of testing you find where you are on this and it sort of gives you a sense of just like the Myers-Briggs test uh, people you know my ENTJ uh, would tell me that I'm a hard-charging executives with no uh, uh, no second thoughts or whatever and sure. stuff like that well why why do I say this stuff why do I Kevin and Pe I warn it off well where did it come from the Enneagram Institute which is a you can find it on the website and you can get all the details you want about this uh, says that you know they can trace this way of thinking back to the death cert fathers or the or the or the Sufi spiritualist or the Kabbalah Jewish mysticism and it has other claims about where it came from well actually the first time that we can record it in history was in a Russian occultist named uh, I'm sorry in a, in a Greek American occultist named George Godiah and his disciple P.D. Uspensky came up with the the language and it was then taken by a fellow named Oscar Ichazo uh, and Oscar Ichazo said that while taking mescaline which is a narcotic uh, Indian uh, Mexican uh, peyote the archangel Metraton I believe that's who it was came to him and explained to him the meaning of the enneagram so Gurdjieff used it to uh, describe the cosmic orders of the universe, and Ichazo used it uh, to describe human personality. Ichazo was an occultist. He believed in you know, seances, and he was a pagan. One of his disciples was a psychiatrist named uh, Claudio Naranjo, and Claudio Naranjo uh, promoted this way of thinking with the veneer of psychiatry and in the 70s it was taken up by some within the Catholic Church on the sort of the mystical contem contemplative side and there it resided for a number of years until it broke into Protestantism about five ten years ago and because it came out of Catholicism people thought well this must be like Crisio which came out of Catholicism sure it was a good thing mm -hmm. And so there's some evangelicals and some members of the ACNA who really just love it because it's a simple classification tool that helps people understand who they are. It's much more, Myers-Briggs has been around for so long and people have now figured out Myers-Briggs doesn't work. And these people who support it within the church say it helps you find an awareness of yourself, self-understanding, self-actualization, self-realization. I say my opinion is that so, that this is satanic. Now, that doesn't mean it is satanic in the way that pornography is satanic mm -hmm. or uh, Ouija boards are satanic. You can play the Ouija board game once when you're 14 years old at a party. You can read a dirty magazine once or twice. But if you make it a habit of it, it opens up your soul to the work of the devil. You become addicted to pornography. You basically addict yourselves to trying to connect with the spirit world. In Enneagram, you're allowing the spirit world of Claudio Chauzo and uh, George Godayev to direct your Christian life and witness. And you can't use demons because this is how it is described by its authors. Now, its supporters will say, well, we've baptized it. We've Christianized it. We've taken out the demonology. Perhaps. But I just say, you know, buy Cosmopolitan magazine and take the 12 steps to being a better housewife <laughs> rather than spend the money on enograms. Well, you said, really, you, you, you said you can read pornography once or twice. I said you can be exposed to it and walk away from it without the addiction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, lots of kids uh, end up in, you know, uh, somebody's basement and somebody brings out the, 
yeah, I remember back in the it must be seventies now, somebody brought out a Playboy, and I walked away, no big deal, you know. But there's so many people. Just, well, you just read the articles, Kevin. You didn't actually look at. The I did. I didn't. I wasn't there long enough to even know there were articles, but it was it was sort of the joke through the high school, and so you know you can be exposed to this and not go astray, um, but why expose yourself to something that's not really beneficial and uh that's where i am on this you know is it really a good tool i don't see i don't see a purpose to it because my self-assessment comes through scripture my spiritual mm -hmm. assessment comes through scripture and uh thankfully the the holy spirit and thankfully uh encouragement amongst other brothers and sisters of christ in worship I don't get my identity from Enneagrams, Myers-Briggs, or any other self-assessment, including my horoscope, which was so darn accurate. You know, so, yeah. See, it's the modern phenomena of wanting shortcuts. Mm -hmm. um, the path towards holiness, if you want to use a Wesleyan expression, or climbing uh, Mount Carmel, to take it from St. John of the Cross, our lifelong journeys towards union uh, with God in this lifetime and thinking that this is modern 20, 20 cent, 21st century America and that we can find something like the internet that will connect us immediately and give us the answer then we can go back to watching HGTV um, it doesn't work that way your faith life is a progressive accumulation of wisdom of successes and failures of basically stripping away your uh, brokenness and sinfulness and until you come to a place where you tend totally stand totally naked before God and even then you realize that you need his love his blood to save you because you can't do it by yourself yeah. and an anagram is a form of the doctrine of works that by having these tools you can short circuit the process of uh, sanctification so friends um, you do it once you do it twice you do it as part of a work assessment it's not going to be any big deal but if you start thinking that this is the path that you can use to get closer to God it is a path but it takes you farther from God not closer to God just like opinion. pornography very good george <laughs> way to bring it all around um closing story why is england going all crazy over the death of prince philip and uh why is some people in the church making him almost saint-like and i somebody asked me this week and my response is he was such a long-term royal like the queen that most people in england that's all they know is you know prince philip they, there's no other royals there's no other queen for certain their whole life they know this i don't have any trouble if they go way over the top uh praising uh, uh his spiritual life his physical life his royalness his uh affinity and love and tradition with queen mary or queen mary Qu queen elizabeth uh, it, it's fine there's nothing wrong with that because uh it, it would be like it, probably a hundred years of Ronald Reagan <laughs> in America. We would certainly be over the top with something like that. So I have no trouble with uh, uh, people going over the top with the death of Prince Philip, including the Church of England. Um, at least they have an opinion on something, George. Well, I'd much rather have them, I'd much rather read stories about tributes from the bishops to the Church of England than plans to ensure that so much of a percentage of new clergy are minorities or women or mm -hmm people of you know this or that or the other persuasion um it's a it's a wonderful break from wokeness it is now using my amateur psychology skills i would say that uh philip uh stands in such contrast to his son charles who stands in such contrast to his son uh harry that uh you see sort of the decline of the species uh father to son to grandson uh, William may turn things around. He anyway, certainly seems yeah. to have a promising yeah. start. But, you know, this is the last, if you will, of the, in America, we call them the greatest generation, the war mm -hmm. generation, that, that generation who uh, served and fought and, you know, did not have that narcissism 
uh, some of them did, of course, but uh, as a culture, uh, you know, for instance, my grandfather's youngest brother, Peter, just died uh, this past week, Peter Munger. And Peter was 19, 18, 19 when he went ashore at D-Day on the second day with the Pennsylvania Division and fought across Europe and took part in the battle for the Hurtigan Forest and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, he never really told stories about stuff like this other than to say that, you know, he went out, got married, had a family, had a productive life and loved this country and personified dignity, honor, courage in my little mind. Mm-hmm. And in and in Prince Philip's case, I think he, you know, served in the war. Uh, Gavin Ashenden, our uh, former partner on this show, his father served in the Royal Navy. They were shipmates uh, in the uh, North, Amer- North Atlantic convoys together. And Gavin's father would say that Philip really was a man's man. He was a yeah. wonderful fellow. Man's man who got married to Queen Elizabeth, knowing that he would always be in her shadow. Wow. You know, it, nowadays men are supposed to be that progressive that they would always be in the shadow of their wives. Back then, that was not the, the, the time honored thing to do. So, uh, you know, three cheers to uh, Prince Philip. And uh, if uh, um, the church wants to go all gaga at this time for Prince Philip, I have no problem with it. He was a lifetime person who, uh, thanks, Kat. <laughs> who at no point uh, uh, has any controversy that we're talking about in, in his life. You know, he never let the queen down. Good for him. George, what a great show. It went long, and I have to do some edits because we had a cat uh, going crazy in the background that you'll never hear about. Uh, we had some phone calls that you probably will hear about, but uh, that's just part of being in a live studio. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Congard, and you've been watching episode 657 of Anglican Unscripted.